Wednesday, June 4th. I'm Rem. I'm Scott. And this is Geek Nights. Tonight, Levels of Discourse. Let's do this. Today is Thursday. What's the day? January 4th. January 4th. As I just said a second Wait, ago. Wait, it's not January 4th. June 4th. June 4th. It's, it's one of the J months. You're a few months off. Uh, uh, and on June <laughs> 6th and 7th, 2009, is the Museum of Comic and Cartoon Art Arts Festival um, in a new place. It's not, it's not in the Puck Building where it has previously been. It is instead... Nope. It is at the uh, 69th Regiment Armory at 68 Lexington Avenue between 25th and 26th. Ooh, in an armory. I hope I, there's arms there. I don't know. As cool as arms might be, I'm really going to miss that vintage elevator in the Puck Building. There might be a vintage elevator in the armory. It might actually be a really big elevator meant to transport arms. <laughs> They might not let me ride it. No. Actually, a lot of the armory places are like just buildings that used to be armories, but now are not armories in any way, shape, or form, other than that they are big buildings that yep. were previously armories. But suffice it to say, if you listen to Geek Nights, you will probably enjoy the mocha. If you're a comic person, even if you just like reading the Sunday comics in the newspaper... The Mocha is a place to go, and it is cheap. It is like 10 bucks to go there. It's 10 bucks. And basically all you do is you don't even have to go there for that long. You just show up, you pay your 10 bucks, you walk around, you look at every single table, and you talk to everybody, and you hang out a little bit, and then you go home. And with a wallet empty and a sack full of comics that were probably not available many other places in the world. You also and pretty much get to meet the artists of any indie comic that I you I know, read. right? It's like you go to a comic book convention, like a typical one, right? And all the comic creators, you know, some of them might be in the artist alley, but most of them, the, the high-level ones anyway, it's like you got to pay for an autograph or maybe you got to wait in line or they're, they're on a panel. At the MoCA, like, you'll have some indie guy who printed his comic at Kinko's sitting at one table, and the table immediately next to him has super famous guy, right? And... Every table, the person sitting there is pretty much the person is 90% of the time the person who made the comic and not someone else. So uh, the mocha is the awesome and the win is 10 bucks. It's in New York City. Hey, it's, I want you can actually, go Saturday or Sunday or both. Are there any after parties that we should go to? Because we missed everything last year, but the year before we went to that after party. Oh, yeah. I don't know about any after parties this year. I did not investigate that. We might situation. have our own after party, though, because kind of at the last minute, half the crew is coming out to go to this yeah, thing with us. It being up in the 20 something ish area, I think we should go to the conveyor belt sushi restaurant. I think we will get some Kaiten sushi, and then everyone but Scott will do karaoke that is also in the Kaiten sushi place. Is karaoke in the Kaiten Sushi place? Yeah, upstairs. I did not know this. Yeah. But I will not do any karaoke's. <laughs> There's a lot more than $10, and it's it's stupid. <laughs> I don't know how you can not like karaoke. No human can not like karaoke. Uh, most humans don't like karaoke. I would argue that humans like karaoke. Karaoke isn't the same thing as disco, only See, I like disco. I like disco, too. <laughs> but I don't like karaoke. See, and most people dislike disco and karaoke. See, the thing is, there are two kinds of karaoke. There's the... Lame American, you know, it's a bar and there are drunk women at the front singing the same song over and over again. And then there's rent a private room and hang out with friends singing. Both kinds suck for the same reason. No, you suck. Anyway. So, news time. Yeah, I guess we don't have to do news. It's Thursday. It's the lounge. Whatever. I got something I want to talk about. Something though. you want to talk yeah, about. Yeah, so there was an article in Newsweek, which is, I guess, which is real news, right? Serious news, not internet news. All right. One could say that. The article was about Oprah. And it called her out on all her snake oil bullshit hardcore. Really? So I was like, really? In the real news? And it was a big, long article that got everything right. And it talked about how there are these two good doctors who are on Oprah, but there's all these other bullshit people. And Oprah defends anyone who comes on her show. And it really, like picked apart Oprah's psychology and like, you know, how she, why she's all fucked up in the head. Oprah has already responded. Oh, she responded? Because there was a, um, there was something about, uh, like, she wouldn't comment. It said in the article that she wouldn't comment, but there was, like, an official, like, two-sentence statement or something. Yes, the statement is, quote, for 23 years, my show has presented thousands of That's topics. That's the statement, yes. Yes, that reflect the human experience, including doctors' medical advice and personal health stories that have prompted conversations between our audience and members of their healthcare providers. 
audience members, and their healthcare providers. I trust the viewers, and I know that they are smart and discerning enough to seek out medical opinions to determine what may be best for them. So she said nothing. Right. And the thing is, right, she, she says, I trust the viewers, right? But at the same time, right, one time she had someone on promoting some, like, Randy, you know, shit. And someone then, like, wrote her a letter that was like, yeah, because of you, I'm not getting chemo. I'm going to do the Randy shit instead for my cancer. And then Oprah had to tell the person, you know, uh, actually, you should probably go get your chemo and your radiation. So you trust the viewers, but then you there you realize that you told them wrong, and you have to correct well, them. And you see, the, the the thing is, uh, while people argue that Oprah has done a lot for communities in general, I still just cannot forgive her for the fact that she constantly and blatantly just kowtows to. ADC and Randy bullshit. Well, basically anything that's on her show is something she's promoting and endorsing and defending, right? And she endorses and, and promotes way too much She'll just endorse and BS. promote whatever, you know? And she's so, you know, she's not... A, a, she, I mean, what really are Oprah's credentials other than I have a lot of money and I've been on TV for a long time and I know how to speak in a way that, you know, uh, is makes my, you know... Uh, She's just a really good salesperson to a very specific audience. That's, oh, wow. That's her only... You know what came out of the woodwork? Mm -hmm. Already, all the news I can find, all the opinion pieces, are people lambasting this article. How dare they attack Oprah, a pillar of the community? They're just attacking her because they're racist. <laughs> racist? Okay. Or uh, sexist, or sexist. It seems like it's equal parts race, equal parts sex. Right. Read the Newsweek article and oh, know... Oh, that's spelled wrong, too. That's great. Read the Newsweek article. The Newsweek article is 100% correct, and anything that disagrees with it is wrong. And if you disagree with it, you are stupid. <laughs> stupid. So in, Oprah's a bitch. She so, has too much money. So in so, some <laughs> personal news, since we want to get right to the main bit, I think yes. it's an interesting topic, but I'm sure many of you in the forums have, have seen all the rumblings and people who follow my Twit tweet twitter tweeter that i don't update that often because i hate twitter but i use it occasionally and I, you know i've been in the market for a house and i found a house and things are going well and it looks like very soon i'm going to be writing a very 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 large check and becoming a member of the landowning gentry finally i will be able to vote i will be able to speak before the senate i will get all the privileges of the land owning you upper class do, that's that it's it's 19 it's the, actually no it's 2009 not 1709 so when, that when did this happen yeah so you're saying that people who don't even own land have the right to vote i've voted you don't own any land i know that, that's a travesty <laughs> well how, how can how, without the noblesse oblige how can one possibly make complex decisions well in fact the people who own land get fucked more because you have to pay the land tax that we uh we voted in I us non-landowners i thought taxes only applied to poor people and immigrants no the taxes in fact apply more to the people with the land well luckily i have land so i can do something about it uh <laughs> <laughs> you prepared that well in advance <laughs> actually no i was gonna make a different set of jokes but i can't tell you why it's too stupid <laughs> You still won't tell me what that is. I, I wonder guess. if anyone listening knows what that's from. I, <laughs> it's, it, it's weird because I feel like I know what that's from, but I don't actually know. You know, there's no way you know. No, I know I don't. It's just <laughs> too stupid. <laughs> but no, it, it, I, it's almost like I have an unreferenced point. I have this pointer, and I see the pointer there, and I say, all right, that pointer means I know what this is. So I go in my brain to the pointer. And it's not pointing. It's at a null anything. pointer. It's a null pointer, but yes. But I keep trying to reference it. I will. Uh, I will denullify your pointer soon enough. Uh, okay. Yes. You gonna wait for the crew to come out because we have to show them a story from North America first. No, no, it's not. It's not a video. It's not a video. No. All right. It's not. It's not something that can be gotten quickly. But anyway, things of the day. So you ever wonder what happens to all those hats? on the ice after a hat trick you don't get them back i, I know mean, that much i don't wonder what happens if you're throwing a hat just this is a note for people right i was at the new york giants super bowl victory parade uh wow already two years ago <laughs> and uh a kid in front of me like took his friends you know super bowl victory hat what? and threw it to get it autographed Asshole. and so the, the hat does not come back in you know it, it just doesn't happen so if you're getting ready to throw a hat on the ice not an expensive hat. <laughs> Do not throw your fancy hat. Well, apparently the majority of hats that are thrown are either old, worn, 
hats, like one that someone's been wearing forever, mm. or they're just a throwaway hat that someone brought in a bag to throw in case they're Exactly. Was a hat I used to. Whenever I went to a hockey game, I always carried with me. I had this really dumb hat that I hated. It was just like, it had this like metal mesh on the brim. Did you, did you uh, yeah, see so you had a hat in one bag and an octopus in the other? I didn't carry the octopus. Octopi are too smart for me to feel uh, happy throwing one on the ice. They like it on the ice. No, they're already dead. They live in cold waters. <laughs> <laughs> but I've seen octopuses thrown on the ice because I know it's a hockey tradition, but it's much more prevalent in the Midwest than it is everywhere else. I mean, <laughs> a, in, a, when I went to like the Red Wing Stanley Cup playoffs back in the day, like 96, 97, they had a giant uh, octopus thing called Stanley that would come down from the ceiling over called the ice. Stanley? It was called Stanley. Stanley the octopus. <laughs> uh... It's not the thing to name it. Little known fact, all you non-hockey fans, you throw an octopus on the ice because there used to be eight games in the series. Mm -hmm. Now it's seven, but they still throw octopuses because there are no seven-legged animals. Yep. <laughs> but apparently, well, not apparently, I found this article that explains what happens to the hats, and it's kind of interesting. What happens with the hats? Oh, should I tell anyone or should you read the article? Well, is it really that complex that you can't tell right. it quickly? One, the players keep them. Usually oh. they take all the hats that aren't disgusting <laughs> and they leave them in the dressing room of the player who scored the hat trick and he can do with them whatever he wants. That's nice. They throw away the scary hats. <laughs> the nasty hats the guy doesn't want to keep. I would, want, I would want all the hats, every single one. Some teams, actually, what they do is they take all the hats they send them to a company just to get them steam clean really quick, and then they donate them to charity. That's good, too. You know, that's what happens to the, because, uh, you know, in the Super Bowl, right, when the team wins, suddenly there's all these hats and T-shirts that say, you know, New York Giants, Super Bowl 42 champions, and all the uh, hats and T-shirts that say New England Patriots, uh, Super Bowl 42 champions, they send those to Africa and places where, you know, no one in America will ever see them. There was one time I did not, I had the hat, I did not throw it at the hat trick. Whoa. Because Sergei Fedorov scored two goals, and he accidentally scored one against the Red Wings. <laughs> so it was technically a hat trick. No, it's not. <laughs> it had the, the commentators counted it as one. It's least. not a hat trick. <laughs> well, they lost the game, too. It's another it was, kind of trick. <laughs> I, I almost, of course, my brother, if you think I was into hockey, my brother, I remember he was like, the noise that came out of him was like a Wookiee dying. <laughs> there's also a picture here of a case apparently the columbus blue jackets every time there's a hat trick they put all the hats from the ice in this bin and they keep the bin on display mm. and they've put every hat every hat from every hat trick they've ever gotten since their first hat trick which was in 2001 and there are not that many hats in there well that's not it's a relatively new team and they're not that good yeah there aren't that they're, many hats. you know they're not terrible but they're not that good Okay. That's all I got. So I'm pretty sure this is not a duplicate thing of the day. If it is, shoot me, right? I all right. I checked the thing of the day feed, and uh, it was not in there. And also, I think I posted it in a forum maybe just because I couldn't wait to post it somewhere, but I'm pretty sure it was not a thing of the day. Basically, what this is is a game called Wayfarer. And uh, what it is, it's a roguelike game. If you've never played a roguelike game, I think we've discussed them on the show previously. It's pretty much a game just like NetHack or like Rogue, the original roguelike. <laughs> it's, a, it's basically a dungeon crawl. You walk around, you kill bad guys, you get treasure, you, you, know, you explore the dungeon, you, know, you see more dungeon as you explore. The dungeon is randomly created. You know, it, it's, it's pretty much you know, a straight up kind of RPG, but not RPG in the good way, RPG in the Dean. It's like Hero Quest, one player. That's what it is. <laughs> All right. Right? So, um, Wayfarer is a roguelike, because most of them are sort of difficult to play at, and or annoying. This is a web-based one that is Java-powered, I think. It's got some 3D action, but not really. Um, and it actually has a really good user interface, and it makes it like a lot more pleasant to play, a lot more accessible, and actually sort of maybe a little bit fun and definitely a lot a million times more fun than other roguelikes as far as i'm concerned even though it's maybe less complex than other roguelikes but i mean it's still alpha and it's already made it that far so i think there is actually a, a significant potential in this game and if you are bored and you got nothing better to do and you're out of computer with the web browser and you know all the other games aren't really exciting you 
Uh, why not? It's free and it's an alpha. What the hell? So on to the topic. And we, we were inspired. There was an article linked on Slashdot, The Perils of Pop Philosophy. Mm-hmm. You should all read the article. We're not really going to talk about the article in depth, but it's a fantastic article. Pretty good. And it got us to talking a lot about the topic. And then from there to this kind of broader concern that it's one of those things where the more I think about it, the more I realize just how much it controls or at least influences the the interactions I have every day with every information source or destination in my entire including life. Including this show, even. Definitely the show is a victim, right? So here's, here's the basic problem here, right? Is the guy talks about uh, the article references another article, and the other article is discussing some philosophical topic, right? And the guy who's writing this article sa- says basically, yeah, that other article is a load of shit, right? But you wouldn't really know unless you were, you know, like a philosophy expert. And he says, here is my counter argument to that other article. And it's a whole bunch of big, fancy philosophy words that nobody who doesn't have a philosophy degree will be able to understand. I didn't understand what he was saying at all. But what he basically, the the gist of what he points out is that if someone, it's very easy to make a stupid claim or Mm. a fallacious argument. It is very easy to refute that argument if you know about the topic. It is almost impossible to refute that argument in a way that people who aren't familiar with the field will see or understand. Yeah, I mean, by using all his big philosophy words and all his philosophy knowledge, he was able to easily and trivially refute this other argument. However, the only people who could understand and comprehend the refutation were other philosophy experts. And for him him to make that refutation accessible to the mass populace, he'd basically have to write an entire book worth of normal non-philosophy talk, right? and And it goes further than this when you really think about it, because say someone makes a fallacious claim, and even you're not trying to convince anyone else, you don't have to explain the refutation to anyone else. Just you're trying to argue with the person who made the fallacious claim. Mm hmm All right. You have, you know, 10 different ways to refute them. So you use one, and they don't understand it. Or you use two, and they don't understand it. Or you can't... Basically, it comes down to the fact that you can't engage them on the level where the claim is fallacious if they're not able to engage you back. They're not able to reciprocate. Right. It's a, so if it, I engage... If I make a claim at level one, and someone else refutes it at level one, they're like, basically, they're equal. There's no real way to determine... Mm-hmm. Which one is right? It happens It happens with science a lot, right? You get, like, some person who comes around, and they're not an expert at science. They don't know anything about, you know, they know the world is made of atoms and molecules, and that's about it, right? So they come and say some bullshit about evolution or something, and they're completely wrong, but you, so you go to explain why they're wrong, and you, you're, you're a biologist. So you're, you, the only people who understand what you're saying are biologists. And for you to get this non-biologist person to understand why they're wrong, you basically have to give them a university biology education first. It comes down to the fact that the, the refutation of some kinds of fallacies is in a higher order than the fallacy itself. And it's so it's not, one order yeah. to make the fallacy, but it is impossible to refute the fallacy without making a higher order argument. Yeah, and it's not just in arguing either. It's just in general comprehension, right? I mean, you know, some guy writes a newspaper article that speaks very colloquially and is completely wrong because it, you know, summarizes and generalizes, but people understand it and it sort of makes sense on the level at which people are thinking. And these people have never thought about the topic on a higher level and don't have the education or expertise or whatever they need to understand the higher levels of the particular topic. And as it stands in that state, it makes perfect sense. And they go on believing this thing. And that's that, you know, and people think in their minds about things, you know, people, some guy who's say, I don't know, an engineer, right, will think about, say, you know, medicine in some simple way because he's not an engineer, but he's thinking about medicine in the highest order that he can think about medicine and he'll come up with something. And thus he now, you know, believes something about medicine that's probably wrong because he, you know, he he doesn't have the knowledge in that higher order in that department. But what I really want to talk about, we could go on and on about this specific topic, Mm -hmm. but there's not a lot to say, but I think the more general interesting topic is the interactions between people on the internet or in real life where one person wants to engage on one level, another person can't or won't engage on that level, or the situation where you have a topic 
where the only way you can have a meaningful conversation is to engage at a higher level. Right, because all of the low-level things are sort of already figured out. I mean, when you try to talk philosophy with your friends, you might think you're all smart and stuff, but like, really... It's all just shadows on a wall. Yeah, we've right. been over that the thing a is, long time ago. Right, you know, real philosophers, you know, people who really know this shit and write books and, and well, not everyone, some people write bullshit books, but, you know, real philosophers, right? Uh, wait, wait, real. Real. We're getting yes. the, some Scotsmen I, in the I understand house. that's a fun John Drew Scotsman, <laughs> but... Oh, I got it. Someone made a website of a graphic for every logical fallacy, and wow. the Notre Scotsman was just an angry willy. That's good. But they, uh, you know, they figured out everything you were saying, and you're basically treading over well tread ground. You're rebuilding already built wheels, you know? So, in order to sort of get into new areas of thought, you really have to sort of learn all the, you know, things that have come before and crawl up to the, you know, to the higher level. Imagine if, say, we're all, all of humanity together is building a ladder, right? And the ladder is 10 steps tall, and we need the 11th step. Well, only people on the 10th step can build the 11th step. You know what? You're down you on got... the third step. You don't know the fourth step exists, and you think you're all smart figuring out the fourth step. You know you know what you just said? What? It's almost word for word from the fourth way. I know. <laughs> Stupid fourth way. Oh, so close, but still crazy. Right. You know, and it's sort of like, hey, if you don't, you know, see all the steps that are already there, you're just, you know, what are you doing? I don't think we need more analogies. I think it's... it's... Oh, I love analogies. It's I'm more... the analogy. Master. It's a real world thing where I, I have this problem personally. The, my interest in the topic is that many times I'll be in, I guess I'm in low level mode when I'm walking around in the street. I don't expect anyone to, a stranger to out of the blue while I'm like walking and eating my baguette to engage me suddenly on a high level. There's usually kind of like, we all go through this. When you talk to someone you don't know, where there's the probe, you probe each other. It's like a protocol, a handshake, where you both feel out what the level of discourse is going to be for the remainder of this new conversation, mm -hmm. this new encounter. You know, you make the comment about the weather. They say something back about the weather. You've established that baseline level. You mention, you make an offering about politics. You see if they make a high or low level statement, and then you respond accordingly, and then the discourse is set, and you have your discussion. But... Much like in Burning Wheel, uh, the Blossoms Are Falling setting, where ah. I, I, I was thinking about this a lot. In that setting, it's based in like old Japan. So there are different levels of formality of the Japanese language. And the rules in the game are that you test against another player to see what you as a group set the level of discourse as for your discussion. And depending on the level of discourse, some topics are or are not allowed to be broached mm. without a serious breach of etiquette. Mm -hmm. And the same thing happens in real life. I mean, say I'm, I'm sitting on the train and the guy next to me says something about politics, like blah, 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 Obama. Now I have a choice to engage them on their level, higher level, lower level. I don't know really what their level is at. But if they won't engage on the higher level, like if someone is just a Democrat or a Republican and the only argument they have for being a Democrat or a Republican is like the talking point of their pundit of choice on either side, there is no possible way I can have a conversation that'll be meaningful with this person unless I either force them to engage on a higher level or, I don't know, not talk to them and not have the... I mean, I guess it, it might be meaningful for them, but how is it meaningful for me if they only have talking points? I've already heard every talking point. I already have a refutation for every talking point. They can't comprehend any of them. So what's the point of even discoursing? What's the point of even engaging at that point? Well, I mean, you know, to give you, uh, you know, in that example, I can't think of a reason to engage. But for example, on our show, we will often discuss things related to game theory, right? But we will not engage the game theory topics on the highest level, you know, and... The point is that even though the audience, some of the audience, I'm sure, would understand it, but many, most of the audience, we assume, does not, and we try to, you know, th say things in a way that they will comprehend them. You know, yep, we, the we won't say, I mean, "Oh, it, that's," you know, because I mean, we could sum it, we could end the show in like a second. Like we're discussing a game, we'll be like, "Yeah, that's just, uh, you know, zero sum perfect information game." Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, how the many states? How many states does it have? Uh, ten to the sixth. Yeah. All, all right. right.
<laughs> so you're right, but you know, to we instead, you know, when we're d- discussing on the show, sometimes we either a we take the route of giving all the full, we we engage on the high level, but we break the words down and go on longer so that they get the full idea, or we simplify to get just given the gist, right? And hopefully we can educate them over time and bring them up to the higher level. So how, how noble of you. I know, right? But, you know, there are many... T- I'm sure, you know, that's some of the topics that we're familiar with. There are many topics for which we cannot engage on the high level. For example, we'll say something about... We talk about viruses. How many times do we say something stupid on we the say show? Something Every about, day. We, we, pro- we probably already said 20 stupid no, things on the show. How many times do we say something about viruses? And then, you know, the next morning, I get an email from Scott Johnson and Pete and Lisa. Yeah, right? <laughs> like, you viruses know. do not work that way. You know, or we say but stupid things about, like, economics the problem, or who knows what else. I mean, that other article really points it out is that the long-form debate almost never happens in modern society. Mm-hmm. Because no one has the patience and no one's going to pay attention. And generally, the people who are up for it a long-time debate or a long-form debate, are the ones who are already trying to engage at a higher level in the first place. Exactly. I mean, you know, and this goes back to that Neil Postman book that you disagreed with, right? Where he was talking about how, you know, the medium is the message. And he talked about how Lincoln Douglas would, you know, debate for reals, and people would sit there for hours, and they would debate at a very high level. And if you look at the old newspapers, you know, it was m- See, much I, higher level. I than guess the- I disagree with a lot of his conclusions because a lot of what he predicted did not come to pass. I don't know. That book was from the 80s, I think. Yeah. Right. So, I mean, you know, the major the major point of the book, though, was that, you know, the medium in which you are communicating. Right. uh, You know, modifies the message. You know, on TV, you can't have these long, boring things, because when you do, you get like that boring PBS news show that nobody watches. But Scott, I love things like that. You do. But most people don't. Yes, but I don't think it's. And he talks about how, you know, this medium is, you know, the the mediums of the olden days were better for the long form. Level. Because and you look at the internet, right? The internet is good for Twitter. It, they just they shorten no, everything. See, the shorter the better. Scott, I, I disagree that the medium forces. The it message. doesn't force, but it is optimized to a particular message. And even though you could see, put any sort of message in any sort of medium, it won't. No one will go for no, it. No, see, Scott, I also disagree that it's even optimized for a particular message. All it is is that society itself, people generally are lazy and would rather not engage on a high level in most cases. And even back then, I would I would wager that not that many people in the U.S. understood what was going on in Lincoln versus Douglas. I don't know. I, you, I mean, how many people were all for the Civil War? Yeah. On the South. Yeah. They clearly couldn't win. It was, yeah, but Any it, high level debate would have pointed that out. Well, that was just because in those days, right, they didn't have the, you know, the amount the amount of information that we have today. See, I get, everyone see, I knows just, everything about everything. I don't everywhere. want to get into Neil Postman because I disagree with a great majority. But it's the same thing that he's that you're saying now, talking about the no, high level and the low level. But I don't think it has anything to do with the medium. It's just people. I don't know. About I think that. people generally avoid the high level discourse, partly because high level discourse takes a long time. But high level discourse was commonplace, you know, was in the really? olden days. Yeah, it was. I don't think it was. You look at the, you know, the the quote reading level of, you know, the as you go back in time. It, you uh, know, Scott, I point out as you go back in time, you're looking at the reading level of a smaller and smaller subset of the literate population. This is true. I mean, the further back you go, who who is literate? The wealthy aristocrats and the philosophers and the people like that. The people with schooling, learning, and knowledge. So you had a smaller, so, more literate so, set. So what do you say? So you're saying that now, right? It's now no, people. It, you're basically saying it's no different now. That even though the people are literate, they're not. They're still not as as smart as the you know. So really, still, even though everyone can read the words technically. Only the people who are actually educated and wealthy and whatnot are really literate. Is that what you're saying? I think there's a strong correlation. Mm-hmm. Sadly. Uh huh. All righty then. You said that like you're going to use this in some sort of argument against me. No, I just wanted to, to put that on the table. All right. It's out there. I think it's more that the general, pro- like, as we democratize access to distribution of ideas and consumption of ideas, That does not necessarily precipitate the full dissemination of those ideas because every person, regardless of their ability, is exposed to them, but not everyone can get the same thing out of them. Mm -hmm. I mean, an idea is a meme, and a meme can spread, and some people can 
ex can take on and then retransmit larger memes than other people. So maybe the same percentage of people throughout history just have the innate ability to handle large memes. And some people can be trained to, some people can't, some people refuse to. But the result is that if you add, if you add more people to the water where the meme virus is spreading, that does not necessarily mean that that meme virus will spread to all those people. And I think the problem with this pop philosophy idea, well, not the problem with the idea, the problem it portends is that memes spread if they're compact little concise things that the more if more people can spread a meme it's going to spread more rapidly because if if only one well, i mean it's the wave at the base it's like you know if you go to baseball at any stadium right the more people that you want to get to do something in unison the the, the harder simpler, the it, has simpler it has to be right if you want to get say 10 people to like sing a song you could do that you just give everyone the lyrics on a piece of paper right but try to get 100 people to sing a song there's one answer soccer hooligans Ten thousand. they can be so drunk they can't see five feet in front of their faces they can sing that song right but i mean you know just... they can't sing you know say a complicated song and they have to you know getting them they have to know that song in advance and they've trained and learned the song over a great period of time if no, you but, just but, 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 like... get a bunch of brand new people you can do the way and maybe you can clap in unison and maybe you can say like one or two words in unison but it's very difficult well, yeah, to get them to but say if, you know do a complex thing but together. if you let me finish but my point and what i think was really happening i think what postman was observing but now we can see it with hindsight more clearly is that it's not the particular merits of any kind of media it's simply that more media is more bi-directional and unidirectional so now we kind of have a wider pool where smaller pieces of information spread more rapidly and have more enduring power. So simply because we have more low power transmitters instead of a few high power transmitters, smaller, low po more low powered pieces of information are the ones that are more fit to survive in the broad population. That's that's it, exactly what you're not disagreeing with him at yeah, all. No, because he's saying that the way the kind of media does it, and he made all these arguments that television uh, the transmission kind of, media. of the media is part of its kind. No, but as that, an aspect of its kind. No, but my, I'm making the much broader argument that it's the fact that it's transmitted at all is the only factor. It doesn't matter how it's transmitted. All that matters is that it is transmitted in any form. And because more information can be transmitted more quickly in general, we self-select toward these smaller pieces. Of of information that is one aspect of it yes that's that's my whole argument <laughs> all right so I think, I think you're on a lower level then uh. <laughs> no i really i just i don't i think his book was kind of crap and i think he made a lot of good points but i think he made a lot of spurious conclusions yeah anyway so yeah it's just you know what is there is it can we come up with any sort of solution for this problem right we want more PR if we have this great thing right that we have basically the whole world almost right is able to communicate with each other without you know any significant hampering of, of time or amount of information or, or you know we can basically get on webcams with everyone all at once right so we want people to sort of get new things instead of just, you know, continuing to mull down low. We want, you know, the highest level, most useful, you know, conversations to be happening as opposed to people just, you know, basically bullshitting, thinking that they're on the high level. It might be impossible. It might be impossible. All right. So let's assume it's not impossible. I mean, just look in at what no, scenario I mean would we... Well, no, Any I mean, chance of it occurring. I think what it shows more is some of the... I think it is either the root or the symptom of the root uh, of a lot of the problems we have in the world today. I mean, look at the inherent problems of democracy. Look at the, look at the national dialogue about any popular topic in the United States. That example. is definitely absolutely the, true. The, the, almost all the discussion of any topic boils down to... I wouldn't even call them talking points. They're just... Like the abortion debate, a lot of the people who are anti-abortion don't have any argument or anything. All they have, a lot of people who are pro pro-choice, don't really have much of an argument either. You know, they just well, boil everything down to the to the you know these incredibly simple things when the issue is ludicrously well, complex. Well, Scott, the thing is with abortion in particular, if you move to the higher levels, 
I think it's clear that one side. Well, has I'm, a- I'm not saying. I'm, I also agree that the pro-choice side is correct. I'm saying is that many of the people who argue, even though they're on the correct side, their argument is not on the highest level, and that you know I could actually, you know, in some cases, I could argue for the wrong side using a higher level argument and beat some of the people on the right side who have a lower no, level. No, you can't argument. beat them because someone who makes it. Remember, someone who makes in one particular field. We're not arguing about the intelligence of our human, just about the. Capability to transmit and relay a single meme in the in the abortion debate, someone who can only transmit the small pro or anti meme cannot be affected by the larger meme in any capacity. Mm. It cannot get to them unless you boil it down. And it is possible to take a large complex meme, make it compact, and still make it true. If you make a good argument at the high level and you boil the argument down to a very small compact thing. The, the end argument is still absolutely true, and your little compact thing is right. The problem is it's very powerful, but it loses kind of the redundancy. It loses like its own self-referential metadata, so it's really easy to corrupt it and use it for the wrong purposes. Like, I make a boiled-down argument that is pro-choice completely, and while pro-choice I think is the absolutely inarguably correct philosophical and practical argument on all high level— I think most intelligent people agree on that point. But I can make a boiled down argument that is pro-choice that is equally valid. However, because it's boiled down, it's so broad and tiny now. Broad in scope, tiny in reference. It is now a powerful philosophical hammer that people can use to back up very poor unrelated ideas. Mm. It's the whole thing of libertarianism on the high level is a great and fantastic field of debate. On the low level, it effectively turns into the rationale for I do what I want, I do what I want. Right. And that's bad. Well, I mean, you know, this makes me think of people like, say, Ben Stein or Michael Moore, right? Two people who are basically completely wrong about a great, great many things to the majority of the time, right? Yep. And what they tend to do is they go and they make, you know, they make, you know, movies or they get on TV and they ch- they talk and they're slightly above, you know, the, the lowest level, right? They get lots of information in there, you know, usually. And they're smart and people. They, many, yeah, they're very smart. They know. Intelligent, right? They know what's going on going on and you know they get their information you know even if their opinions or stances might be wrong most of their information is is correct you know they're they're you know they're well, core facts i'll argue the technically correct right technically correct right that's what i mean um but you know what they'll do is then they'll they'll then deliver it in some sort of package you know that supports basically anything you could take you know you could like take all the facts out of say a michael moore movie and make a movie that argues against michael moore 100 percent with the same exact facts just by changing you know the other parts yep and well, it it's like, like the libertarian thing is the best example where regardless of the high level rationale the low level pop philosophy meme is the rationale to do whatever you want it's the it's the hitler rationale Exactly. So, and unless people are engaging at the high level, if they're down at the low level, they can't really, that's it. They're just, it, it's done. There's nothing, they, they can't contribute. It's almost like these low level memes, or at least these philosophy memes that people use to back bad ideas. It's like you, like you have a responsible gun owner. And, you know, philosophers are all effectively philosophical brain gun owners. They all have, they're responsible owners of very powerful guns. But if you boil down your philosophy to a meme and you're not extremely careful, that's the equivalent of taking your gun and giving it to someone who is blind and stupid Mm -hmm. and showing them where the trigger is and saying, have fun. I'll come back in a week. Yeah, because, you know, to to give, you know, I don't know, I can't come up with it. Look at this. Look at what I just did. If I take this argument and I boil what I just said down into a meme, you could trivially use that to rationalize ivory tower bullshit. That's true. Keeping knowledge from the masses. And it would be trivial to ra- rationalize that with the pop philosophy thing I just spouted because the high order argument is so long that it won't spread in the memosphere. I'll never use that word again in my life and I apologize for saying it. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, but yeah, a high level, a high level idea has lots of ifs and ands and buts and this and that, right? I mean, look at something like, you know, discussion about like, you know, swine flu. It's like, well, it could spread like this and it, you know, the actual reality 
reality is incredibly complex, ludicrously complex. You know? Oh, actually, right but aside. people boil you know that complexity down into you know these simple ideas. You know, that, and aside. they use those simple ideas to make their decisions. And really, no, it's very complex, and your decision making, you know, is not taking the you know your your ba- is basically effective. You, you might as well be acting randomly the way you're making decisions. You know. So I guess there are two immediate questions. One, is there a way to foster a society where the lar- either the intellectually large memes can spread or where the intellectually large memes have more weight regardless of how many people wield them or where people where these memes can be boiled down in such a way that people who aren't going to engage on the top level can still engage on a meaningful level uh people uh, can any of these I, be accomplished well i don't know if you can engage on a meaningful level in an area if you aren't you know if you haven't just learned all you know the things you need to know to get up there it's like if you haven't climbed a stair 10 you're well, not I guess gonna, the, 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 you're another, not involved in the 11th stair building i have run into many people in my life who i know are perfectly capable of engaging me on a higher level than they do and they just don't Mm. There is definitely a, a, a difference between the peop- between the will nots and the can nots. Mm. That's very interesting. And I, I don't know what to do about that. And then that raises the whole other ethical question of, say there I are... Could just, that's just the issue of, you know, apathy. Yes, possibly. but even then, say there are will nots and there are can nots. What do you do with the will nots? What do you do with the can nots? And how do you not make a meme for dealing with them that turns into genocide or eugenics? Uh... Uh, we, you know, we, whenever we do anything like this, you know, it's always like, well, how can we fix the world? Well, well you know, yep. you, do, you do what you can and that's but it. But it, it right? really bothers me because it seems like every, philo- every philosophy, no matter what it is, no matter what it really says, is boiled down generally and widely into, I don't want to say a soundbite, but a meme so small in reference and so wide in scope that... Any possible course of action that any person could take in the entire world, whether it's good, whether it's bad, genocide, killing, babies, whatever, is eminently justifiable if you use only low-level memes. Yeah, go and look at, like, you know, people always... One thing that people really like, I really like, are, like, quotes, right? You know? Aphorisms, perhaps? Yes, you know, you find some famous person, a Thomas Jefferson or uh, a Benjamin Franklin. Those who would give up liberty for security deserve neither. Right, right. You find some quote, and you say the quote, and then someone else goes, oh, that is very wise and makes perfect sense. And then you say some other quote, oh, that's... That is very wise and makes perfect sense, right? But it's great when you see, like, two quotes that are both so wise, like, you know, but it, they completely disagree. <laughs> or, I mean, look, look, those who give up liberty for security deserve neither. You could use that to rationalize the taking away of security from people if you really wanted to. Yeah. You could probably argue for a taking away liberty. Yeah. <laughs> You know, I mean, you could look, oh, the tree of liberty must, you know, from time to time be refreshed with the blood of patriots. Well, you could take that to mean vampires. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, once in a while, you've just got to kill your own people. It's just how it's got to be. Maybe that is how it's got to be. <laughs> uh, you know, maybe. The, maybe I don't, we I don't just need to build so. the. See, I think the problem is ever the academics always look for the ivory tower. I think we need the crimson tower. The Crimson Tower <laughs> must be frequently refreshed with the blood of the academics. Um, Khmer Rouge style. No, nah, I think the blood should flow upward. Upward. Not downward. So it's it's like uh, Ganesh. The but milk that, just goes up. But that means we gotta get the we gotta beat Newton because he's gonna fuck us on this one. Uh, all, right. <laughs> all right. I think we've We're exhausted. Devolving. this. I think we've exhausted this topic. I think I've said every low level di- piece of discourse I have. Oh no. <laughs> <laughs> And don't forget, this weekend, Saturday, we'll be at the Mocha. You'll find us. Saturday, not Sunday? Uh, Very likely Saturday. We will post somewhere if it ends up being Sunday. This has been Geek Nights with Rim and Scott. Special thanks to DJ Pretzel for the opening music. Be sure to visit our website at www.frontrowcrew.com where you'll find show notes, links, our awesome forum, a link to our Frapper map, and links to all the RSS feeds. 
We say feeds plural because Geek Nights airs four nights a week covering four different brands of geekery. Mondays are science and technology. Tuesdays, we have video games, board games, and RPGs. Wednesdays are anime, manga, comic nights. And Thursdays are the catch-alls for various rants and tomfoolery. You can send us feedback by email to geeknights at frontrowcrew.com. Or you can send audio feedback via Odeo. Just click the link that says send me an audio on the right side of our website. If you like what you hear, you can catch the last 100 episodes in iTunes or in your favorite podcatcher. For the complete archives, visit the website, which has everything. Geek Nights is distributed under a Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial Sharealike 2.5 license. This means you can do whatever you want with it, as long as you give us credit, don't make money, and share it in kind. Geek Nights is recorded live with no studio and no audience. But unlike those other late shows, it's actually recorded at night.